Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of this policy forum on untapping the potential of non-wood forest products for Europe's green economy. To welcome all of you, we have Mr. Vladimir Nikolic with us. He is a senior advisor at the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Water Management of the Directorate of Forests in Serbia. He will make now an opening statement. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the second day of this uh, policy forum and to the, to the third session named Competitive and Equitable non wood Forest Products Value Chains. And I would like to, to say at the very beginning that it is my great pleasure and uh, to have an opportunity to speak on the, on the for policy forum like this. Uh, I will briefly introduce you uh, with the situation in Serbia in, in relation to, to non-wood forest products. And uh, uh, I will do it in a, let's say, short presentation. So I hope that all of you see see this, this, uh, this presentation that I shared right now. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. So as, as uh, agreed with, with the organizers, so I will speak about the normal forest products in, in Serbia, uh, about the status, the opportunities and the challenges. So collection and, and processing and trade as well in, in Serbia of non-forest products uh, has, a, has a long tradition. So, uh, and significant revenues from, from these products is gathered in Serbia in the period uh, after the Second World War until the 1990s. And uh, in this period, the process of collecting and trading was centralized. So it was mainly done by the few public enterprises. And after this, after the 90s, so the process of privatization of those enterprises uh, directed us to the emergence of small and medium enterprises that are now, let's say, doing their business in, in this sector in Serbia. Uh, those products are really significant and they appear as, as a raw material base, uh, as well as the, the final products, let's say, in the food industry, in the pharmaceutical industry as well. And uh, in the parallel with, with the organic production, with the expansion of organic production, the importance of non-wood forest products has drastically increased. Here you can see that uh, in the area of the statistical region of Belgrade, the most represented uh, non-wood forest products are medicinal herbs, forest fruits and mushrooms. Concerning the, the legal framework in, in Serbia, so it is regulated by the law on forests, where in the article 62, it is uh, named by as other forest products. So here you can see that other forest products are named as forest fruits, medicinal and, and other plants, stone, sand, gravel, etc. But that their collection can be done with the approval of, of the user, so as the, in the state forest or the forest owners in the private forest, in this can be done only uh, in accordance with the project of using of, of other forest products. What could be an issue and what is an issue? So the forestry sector defines non-wood forest products, but the collection of those products is defined by the legislation of nature protection sector. So at the very top of the pyramid is the law nature protection and then two regulations. So uh, one of the control of use and trade of, of wild flora and fauna, and the other one on the proclamation and protection of strictly protected and protected wild species. So according to this, uh, the Ministry of Environment established a commission for approving the quotas for, for collecting the non wild forest products. And this commission issues a, a licenses uh, for the collection of, of non-wood forest products. And this could be the problem. If you don't get the license, you're not uh, allowed to, to do so. So it's, it's a potential conflict between the forestry sector and the nature, protect, nature protection sector. Uh, current status of collection and processing of, of non-wood forest products is that uh, 
it is mainly used by the local population. Uh, pickers are obliged to undergo the training for the collection and they mostly collect mushrooms, berries, wild fruits and herbs. But there is no quota for collection of non-wood forest products for individual persons. So the Ministry of Environment issues licenses and quotas only for buyers and producers, or, sorry, of processors of non-wood forest products. Uh, as I mentioned in the first slide, it is more, mostly done by the small and medium enterprises, which are located in urban areas. So you are collecting the, the, the non-wood forest products in local areas, but you process it in the urban areas but also the significant number of them is located in villages. And they have from 11 to 50 employees during the season of collection and mostly are established after the 1991. So price of collecting and, and buying the non wood forest products is variable. So it depends on the balance of supply and demand and it is, uh, let's say, frequent during, during the year. Uh, Non-wood forest products is mainly used by the local population and uh, quotas are, sorry, this is the wrong slide. Uh, the challenges which are done is the unsustainable utilization, some illegal harvesting, especially the troubles. So climate change and the degradation of, of forest, forest ecosystem. But on the opposite of the challenges, there are an opportunities, especially on the forestry sector. So the forestry profession should rely more strongly on the, this multifunctional character of, of the resources and to use all the products and services on a lasting basis. And the, for the more intensive use of non wood forest products, uh, it should be open the possibility of developing small, small and medium sized enterprises and some stimulation from the state should be done through different measures for the economic development of rural, rural areas. And uh, from the white paper that we had an opportunity to see, uh, some policy actions that are most relevant for Serbia is the securing the conservation sustainable supply of non forest products. Now we have the second national forest inventory and the area of biodiversity will be more included in this. Uh, transparency, data information flow, are also important for, for us because we really want to know what is collected and what do we have in, in forest ecosystems. And of course, the enabling conditions for collecting and as well as processing of, of non-wood forest products. And I will finalize here. So there is a Latin word that is say use, but not abuse. And this should be the, the main message according to the non-wood forest products. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nikolic, for your uh, for being available to make this uh, opening statement. We highly appreciate this. It is also very helpful for us to have a better understanding on uh, the situation in Serbia. And we, we really appreciate it that you already made a connection to the white paper. So thank you so much. Uh, we would like you. to proceed now by introducing the uh, third session of this uh, policy forum. So, first of all, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Steven Librecht, and I will be, just like yesterday, I will be your facilitator for today's session. And if we quickly go to... Okay, let me check the screen. Yes, here we are. Let me perhaps... Uh, to start, quickly remind the objectives we have for this forum. So basically, why are we here together? Yesterday, I announced that we would like, during these two days, explore the potential of non-wood forest products. Second, we wanted to discuss the actions needed to position non-wood forest products as a pillar of Europe's bioeconomy. And lastly, we want to explore the white paper, and it is a document that Mr. Uh, Nikolic has been referring to. So we want to explore this document, specific sections on it, uh, on policy priorities for non-wood forest products. Now, in terms of the agenda, it is a two-day event, as most of you will know. Yesterday, 
we had two sessions. The first se session was uh, about setting the scene, disclosing the potential of non-wood forest products. We had some wonderful presentations, and I would like to highlight the presentation we had given by the keynote speech delivered by Mrs. Shandy, who was really indicating uh, or pointing towards the traditions, the richness. It's, it was a combination of a presentation, but lots of video material. Um, and during the second session, we had another keynote speech. The second session was about sustainable sourcing and secure supply of non-wood forest products. During that session, we had a keynote speech from Mr. delivered by Mr. Chamberlain, who was pointing towards the legacy uh, that these non-wood forest products basically uh, bring and the need to have reliable data. And I think he made comments that are quite similar to some of the elements that have been highlighted by Mr. Nikolic during his opening speech, such as uti non abuti, it was stated, huh? so use but not abuse, so find the right equilibrium basically, but also the need to have data, the need to have reliable data. And what I would like to say is that there have been uh, much more, many more presentations. We are working towards making these presentations available for all of you. It needs the consent of the speakers. We're working towards it. So, but I think there's going to be sufficiently very interesting material so that you might want to have a look at even later on. Lastly, during session two, we had a presentation delivered by Alvaro Picardo, who was really pointing towards the, uh, the actions needed. Huh? And this was follow up, followed up by a conversation we had with uh, Mr. Poinelli from the European Commission. So we were highly pleased to have somebody from DG Agri with us, explaining, basically depicting the landscape of uh, new and upcoming policies relevant to non-wood forest products. And he was uh, available to also respond to a couple of questions, which we highly appreciated. But that was yesterday. Still yesterday, Mr. Sven Walters from the FAO introduced this manifesto of Alguero, right? And he basically invited you to send in your feedback on this document. You have all received this document. I would like to highlight that you can still send us your feedback until two o'clock today. So please, if you have something to say about this manifesto, we would pretty much welcome your thoughts, your observations, your suggestions. Now let's move on to what's uh, going to be the menu, if you like, for today. Well, this morning we're going to have our third session, which is going to be about competitive and equitable non-wood forest products value chains. We will have as an rapporteur with us Mrs. Santos Silva from UNAC. UNAC is also one of the uh, consortium partners of the Incredible Project together with uh, Ricardo Castellini from CESA4 Foundation. His name has appeared already a couple of times. He's uh, one of the elements of continuity in this policy forum. Now, let's see a little bit more in detail what is the menu for today or for this session. We have another keynote coming up, a keynote on competitive and equitable non wood forest products value chains, challenges and opportunities. This will be followed by a round of success cases for fostering transparency, competitiveness, and equitability of non-wood forest product value chains. So these two blocks basically serve to get a good understanding of competitive and equitable non-wood forest product value chains. And after this, we will again, just like yesterday, shift the attention towards action, what needs to happen. So we will have a presentation on key action on transparency and visibility, of non-wood forest products, and then have a wrap up on the policy actions needed to secure successful non-wood forest products value chains. We hope to have some room for debate. And that brings me basically to one of the points, the final point I would like to mention as part of my introduction. And that is, yes, indeed, it is an online event. We would like to have seen it differently, but that's the way it is we still aim at bringing in variety of formats to enhance the interactivity. So yes, there will be presentations, there will be video material, there will be an exercise, there's going to be room for questions and answers. This is Zoom webinar, which means that presenters will have a different setting with respect to camera, camera and microphone use compared to regular participants. 
regular participants don't have microphone, don't have camera facilities. Now the organizers, that's the team at EFI mainly, they will take care of the settings. And uh, I would like to mention that you have a double functionality that might be relevant to all of you. First, there's going to be the chat that you will find, and that's just a regular chat as in regular Zoom, which you can use to send your technical comments if you have a problem with something, just mention it to us, we will try to solve it. But then there is the Q&A tab, and that is the one that we welcome you basically to use for questions. And well, it will be used not only for the questions, but it's also a vehicle to, to address some of these questions. And we have a team of people scanning through this Q&A continuously, picking up, selecting questions, and we will make sure that uh, there will be moments in which we will use some of our questions basically to inject them in the debate. So we respect the debate. We also respect the timings. We have uh, a program for today. So if we have to cut certain discussions short, it's not a sign of disrespect. It's just that it is time to move on. A final reminder, this session is being recorded. You should have received a notification uh, when joining this uh, seminar. But in case you forgot, just a reminder, this session is being recorded. If you have a problem with that, uh, then I think you know what action needs to be taken. I think that is all for the introduction. Now, let me move to the first point on our program. And that is basically going to be the keynote presentation. And we have, we are very glad to have with us an expert, a professor at the University of Padova, Italy. He's an expert in non-wood forest products. He has been following this project incredible right from the start. So I think he knows many of the team members and it has always, always been a joy to have uh, the interactions with him. Let me welcome Mr. Davide Petanella, Professor uh, Petanella, I should say, who is going to deliver a keynote speech on competitive and equitable non-wood forest products, value chains, challenges, and opportunities. Professor Petenella, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes, but it is not in uh, full screen. Yes, this is better. It's okay. Excellent. Off so we go. As, uh, as Stephen was saying, uh, uh, we have a nice menu this uh, this morning and also in the afternoon. And the first dish of this morning uh, is uh, an Italian dish. I will speak uh, uh, and I will try to introduce uh, the very relevant topic of uh, uh, wild forest products uh, value chain. The connected challenges and opportunities. And here uh, you see the outline of my presentation. It's based uh, on three points. I will start uh, giving a definition of uh, value chain and describing some of the main features of this uh, uh, approach in analyzing the sector. Then I will try to make a proposal of uh, uh, looking at the dynamics in the change of value chain organization defining uh, four steps uh, for typologies uh, of value chain. And I will conclude uh, with uh, one final remark. So let's speak about uh, what uh, wild forest products of value chain are, why we are looking at them, is it useful or not? Here a definition of value chain. The value chain describes the full range of activities which are required to bring a product or service from production through different uh, phases of harvesting, processing, delivery to final consumers and final disposal after use. Very general one. Uh, and to go a bit more in detail, which are the characteristics uh, of uh, value chain related to wild forest products? Well, uh, if you uh, take the traditional classical definition of uh, uh, value chain, you also find a reference to a very initial phase that is design. 
the design is not in my definition is because in our sector in some times uh, is present but normally is missed in nature is designing uh, wfp and we have to take uh, this point not uh, as a limitation not as, as constraint a constraint but as a competitive advantage uh, looking at our sector a uh, second element uh, that I would like to underline is that uh, we are facing with a very diversified value chain typology, as we will see with some examples. Then, uh, frequently, uh, wild forest products uh, are not only commodities or specialties, but uh, they are products associated to very important uh, services, especially those that uh, we are now used to call regulatory and cultural services, like biodiversity protection, landscape conservation, recreation, tourism, and others. And finally, uh, the uh, consumers, at least in a more advanced economy, like uh, in Europe, uh, using uh, um, WFP, are special ones. Uh, normally, uh, we define them in marketing as loss consumer, and the acronym stands for lifestyle of health and sustainability consumers. Um, this means that uh, uh, these consumers have four group of uh, reference values in their purchasing habits. They are inspired by this greening idea. They prefer organic wild products, carbon footprints are important element of consideration. Normally also GMO free uh, products are preferred. Localism, so good attention to local products, to the origin of the product, health and solidarity, attention to the fair trade products. Four values, not always, always very consistent. There is, uh, by sure, a certain level of overlapping, but sometimes even a, a bit of contradiction among them. But uh, this is the market. This is the demand side. So why we work on a supply chain? Uh, we use uh, supply chain, uh, uh, value chain, uh, for positive analysis for understanding the structure and dynamics of the value chain, the distribution of revenues, the employment impacts in each link, the identification of activities subject to increasing and declining returns. Here, an example, a very uh, traditional way of presenting the value chain of uh, many uh, wild forest products, uh, connected with the numerosity of the uh, people employed uh, or of the organization. A classical uh, uh, flow of uh, steps and links that can be described as uh, the hourglass uh, structure uh, of uh, many value chains. Another way of uh, working on positive uh, analysis of the value chains in this sector is uh, that one uh, you, you see here where you uh, define different uh, steps or different links and you look uh, at the connection among uh, companies, uh, among individuals, uh, connection that may be understood as contractual links or flow of information, sometimes even as integrative function. And another uh, uh, useful uh, uh, examples, uh, I think, uh, for uh, analyzing uh, uh, data in the value chain is that one of this graph uh, deriving from the research uh, star tree that we have done some years ago, where we compare the Boletus mushroom picker selling price uh, in a five case studies area. Uh, and Professor here, Pedro, we, we, Professor Petronella, can I briefly interrupt you? It seems there is a problem with uh, your screen in the sense that the screen is sharing because you're mentioning a graph that we don't see it. So probably it's uh, just to... Uh, uh, the, what slide about, seen, what the about... The slide we see is why to work on supply chain is the one that we're seeing right now. Is that okay for you? Uh, uh, no, uh, I, 
let's see now, uh, what do you see? Do you see normative analysis? No, we see why to work on supply chain. And the we see normative analysis underneath. Okay, thanks. So let's try to go on. Yeah, the, okay. second, the second use we do of the value chain or supply chain uh, uh, approach is for normative analysis means uh, to identify new lines of action for policymaker, so which are, can be the appropriate policy response and for the operators also, for the companies involved, which type of investments, uh, how to organize the quality assurance system, how to track corporate commitments uh, to reduce cost uh, and negative impacts uh, in the production and marketing of these products. So let's go to the second part of my presentation where I'll try to define a sort of uh, a dynamics uh, uh, model uh, for describing a value chain in the sector. The first a very simple model uh, that we have to consider is that one of self-consumption. How oh, you could say, but this is not a value chain. Well, I think we have to consider it, uh, especially in relation to the importance uh, of the actors of the number of households involved in this activity. Again, after uh, the EcoStar project, uh, we can say that in Europe, one fourth of the households are involved every year in collecting wild forest products. A very large number, a very large figures. And uh, uh, here you, you see uh, these uh, uh, figures uh, split for uh, the countries that we have investigated in this uh, project, uh, uh, in this research project. Uh, the message I want uh, to, to give you as a confirmation of what we have heard yesterday by Patricia Shanley and by Jam Camberlein is that uh, uh, wild forest products play a very important role in the European culture. As a matter of fact, picking this type of products is the first the most important experience European are doing directly going in the forest. This cultural uh, dimension should be much considered also uh, in uh, all uh, governance measures that we are thinking to introduce in the system. Well, the second model is that one of the local economy. We, are, we have uh, few uh, operators, uh, starting from the harvester, uh, the middleman, the seller, the final consumer, operating uh, uh, in a local market. Normally, this uh, value chain are those one referred to fresh products. We could see, we could say that uh, there are quite primitive value change. There are normally no use of standards and no labels. Uh, frequent, uh, uh, frequently, we have informal transaction, uh, good uh, local food tradition, uh, are involved in the demand and consumption of these products. They play an important role for integrating revenues for people living in rural areas. And sometimes they may be very lucrative. I want to show you a funny example of a new company in north of Italy. They are producing forest eggs, high quality, wild eggs, uh, in, in, uh, produced in a mountain area, very good prices, uh, no much uh, competitors in this uh, niche market, uh, and the system is working, is generating important source of income for the companies and the workers and the employees uh, of the company. Uh, well, uh, which are the problem with these uh, two models? Well, in their development, they can face problem uh, in the carrying capacity of the forest ecosystem. Sometimes, as we heard this morning at the introduction, um, we cannot uh, uh, have the possibility to 
support the high level of harvesting, keeping the sustainability of the forest resources. Sometimes uh, we, we see problem of substitution when the market is growing, new competitive products are coming in the market from outside. And uh, what is happening in this case? Uh, well, uh, we see three potential uh, development paths uh, well described uh, in the analysis of uh, wild forest products economy in developing countries by HOMA. And I'm taking the HOMA model and I'm trying to develop it. HOMA was observing that uh, in the value chain development, uh, we have a phase of uh, growing market, a phase of stabilization. And uh, many times uh, after this uh, phase uh, that is lasting more or less uh, uh, time, we have a value chain collapse due to the unsustainability in the use of forest resources. That is a frequent problem in developing countries or the presence of substitute. Some example can be observed also in, uh, in Europe. Think to rare medicinal and aromatic herbs. And in the past, we had the same problem with tannin and resin. But there are two alternative paths. The first one is domestication. Domestication is a trend, is an option that is uh, uh, characteristic of many uh, medicinal and aromatic uh, plants, as Ahmed uh, Dali was uh, telling us uh, yesterday. Hazelnuts, many berries, some mushroom, Christmas trees. Well, uh, here, uh, of course, uh, it's a pity in some way that uh, we are losing the link with the forest environment. But if you look at this uh, process uh, from the point of view of the needs of rural development uh, is by sure a positive uh, development uh, with the uh, spreading of uh, farming activity and agroforestry system. And the third option is the introduction of market-based innovation, like differentiation, integration, harvesting and processing technology, standard development, and so on. Of course, uh, all these uh, two alternative paths may be supported by governance-related solution. And uh, this is, as a matter of fact, uh, the main issue underlying the uh, white paper, and that will be the basis of our discussion uh, late uh, today. Let's make uh, some examples of this uh, solution, market-based uh, innovation. The first one I was mentioning is the differentiation, differentiation through brand definition, umbrella labels, and certification. There are three fields uh, uh, where these uh, differentiation techniques uh, can be developed, uh, can be uh, analyzed, uh, the impacts on environmental resources, uh, the issues connected with quality and health and uh, socioeconomic. And you know that uh, we have uh, uh, different standards, some of them like Fair Wild mentioned yesterday, uh, different uh, label system, different uh, certification uh, uh, organization providing uh, this uh, service for differentiating uh, uh, wild forest products. And uh, to see in another way this option, here you see the uh, five main scopes uh, of wild forest products certification, the certification of origin and traditional specialities, wild uh, product certification, sustainable forest management certification, organic product certification, and fair trade. Another type of extremely relevant of market-based innovation is connected with integration, creation of association, but also of uh, collective contract agreements. And here we see different models. Again, I refer to the outcomes of the EcoStar project, different model of vertical and horizontal integration, reinforcing the market power of some operator, starting from the harvester and the 
a small scale processing unit uh, living uh, established in rural areas. And another uh, market-based innovation are connected, uh, is connected with the new products or re the rediscovery of old products. Think to birch sap or to raisin, but also to uh, the production of uh, uh, pine stone seeds with the new clones that are more resistant to phytopathology or think to the new use of truffle for cosmetic application. And um, so uh, through these uh, instruments, uh, this uh, uh, innovation, we may stabilize the local economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, when uh, wild forest products are not uh, site specific, uh, neither differentiated, they have no special innovative character, they are much exposed to the process of market globalization. And here comes the third uh, value chain model, that of global value chain, so-called the global value chain. Global value chain entail a more efficient international division of labor based on inter-firm and intra-firm transaction involving customized input and relational contracting. And we have several examples of this uh, uh, emerging global value chain structure also in wild forest products market in Europe. Think again to medicinal and aromatic prod products, to products for cosmetics, to pine nuts, truffles, dried mushroom. A couple of examples, one at the European scale, is impressive to look at the uh, trade flow increase related to uh, the truffle, the fresh travel, truffle. Uh, as you see, that is uh, the level of increase of import and export uh, to and from the European Union countries. Really, we are living in a market that is fully globalized. And they are even more impressed, impressive is the, the, the graph connected with the import of a truffle, fresh truffle in Italy. Imports that is in one way explaining why Italy is assuming a quite strong leadership role also as exporter mainly based on importing uh, raw material huh? and taking into consideration that these are uh, official statistics, but there is a lot of uh, paperless trade that we make, uh, we made an estimate uh, in Italy that is eight times higher than official statistics. So which are the impacts of global value chain development? Well, uh, First of all, we, we should wonder if, uh, in connection with this uh, globalization process, are there any negative externalities? You know that in the last uh, months, uh, we are speaking a lot at the European Union level of, about embedded forest uh, degradation in connection uh, with uh, the so-called Big Five. The deforestation and forest degradation impacts are connected with the import of meat, palm oil, soybean, coffee, and coca. I wonder if we could or should start speaking also of the 500 small uh, uh, wild forest products uh, uh, as a, a factor, as a driver of forest degradation. I'm thinking to, to rubber, to gamma arabic, and others. The international uh, integration through trade is affecting the market power of different operators. So it has not neutral impacts because logistics, stock keeping, traceability costs are much affected. Uh, and uh, these are costs uh, covered by uh, especially in particular retailers and processors. And that's uh, is one of the reasons why we see an uneven revenues redistribution uh, in the development of global 
uh, value chains. Finally, globalization is based on the standardization. And uh, is, there is an evidence that uh, the appropriation of the premium price for standard compliance is normally larger by the retailers than uh, by the uh, producer, the pickers or the harvester. Um, I will conclude the saying that uh, uh, we have uh, an exit strategy. Uh, typical uh, energy, uh, energy exit strategy for the European operator uh, that in one way are affected by the global value chain. Well, uh, the um, wild forest products can be sold as cultural services more than as commodities, hmm? with the part of the products coming from outside the region. Hmm? So we keep uh, the traditional system but uh, we are mainly taking advantage of the uh, WFP-related activities. For example, in the tourist service, selling a permit uh, for a picky mushroom, managing restaurants, uh, taking advantage of accommodation facility, creating uh, networks of uh, small shops, uh, exhibitions, and so on. What we call what I call a service-based value chain. And there are several examples. We have already heard speaking about mycotourism in Castilla Leon, a wonderful example of this type of development, where the value added connected with the tourists is much higher than the value, the strict values connected to mushroom picking. Uh, as a, a commodity, uh, we have a very well-known uh, uh, model of Borgo Val di Taro uh, in Italy, in the Parma province, uh, with uh, a lot of uh, activities uh, that are running uh, exclusively or prevalently based on the idea this is a community, a forest community, connected with the mushroom economy. Uh, in a nearby right. valley, only to give you a, again another funny example, we are running, we were running last year, uh, the eighth world mushroom championship. Again, uh, the, the mushroom is, is not a commodity, it's not a raw material, but is mainly the support for developing a set of services. Uh, in some way, what we see is uh, that uh, uh, the value of the uh, wild forest products is a value that in marketing could be defined as imago products or genius loci for marketing a territory. So we, we create a road, a trail, path uh, for connecting different operators and giving value to uh, our forest resources. One final remark, we are uh, observing, we are in, confronted with a silent fragmented world. In Europe, there are 14 million people that uh, rely on uh, wild forest products gathering for at least 50% of their income. Most of the activities are connected with uh, informal transaction, not visible. There is a huge need therefore uh, for creating more visibility through association among landowners uh, and the producer, increasing their market power and uh, their capacity to provide advocacy services. And we have to say, to be honest and realistic, that the forester traditionally are not uh, skillful communicators. And in the wild forest product sector, communication should be easy and it can be very effective because the key values, the key attributes of this sector are easy to be communicated and are very positive and welcome by many uh, uh, citizens in Europe, nat natural product, healthy, diverse, and so on. And I finished uh, telling you, you will uh, probably have noticed why I was speaking not of non-wood forest products, but of wild forest products, exactly for this reason because we have to change our communication techniques. How will you define a bicycle? Will you define a bicycle 
a non four wheel vehicle and uh, how you will define a spanish citizen a non uh, german european union citizens i think no so my suggestion is use a new term new definition wild forest products thanks a lot and thanks uh, a lot also to my collaborators, starting from Enrico and Nicola. Thank you so much, Professor Petinella, for a very inspiring uh, presentation with all the riches that we are used uh, to, to, to hear uh, when we listen to a presentation from your side on, on the value chain, the HOMA model, the market-based innovation. You innovations, you mentioned several ones, even some trade data, the global value chains, etc. so many things. And uh, certainly at the end, uh, how to basically um, talk about these products as non-wood forest products. And you clearly made the point that perhaps it's not the best uh, way. Uh, excellent. Please stay with us for a while. Let's check if there are questions. I would like to invite all attendees, if you have questions, please, I should have probably have mentioned this at the beginning of this uh, um, webinar. Please send us your question through the Q&A and not at the end of the presentation, even when the question comes in your head or uh, pops up, just let us know so that we can then uh, see uh, what of the questions we can basically uh, deal with. Um, let me quickly check if there are any questions. Perhaps, um, Sarah, could you see if there's any question? In yes, the meantime? please, um, Stephen. Okay, please. We have um, a couple of questions in from our panelists already. Um, so. Um, let's go with the questions from Valentino and Ricardo, and then we'll see if we have we can sort out the rest of the questions that just came in. Okay. Excellent. So, are we going to give uh, Ricardo the? They, they're both panelists already. They can speak. Okay. Excellent. So, Ricardo, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Sorry, I, mine is not very a question. I, I would like to say that David is always great and very inspiring. It's great to highlight the huge room for improvement uh, of the non-wood forest product sector. Uh, it talked about the uh, discovering in Italy new uh, products uh, or old products such as birch sap, uh, it talked about stone pine, new clones, natural resin, which I know well because I work for a Spanish body and uh, truffle for cosmetic use as well. I guess that in other countries, uh, these may be uh, consolidated experiences. For So um, uh, I'm realizing that the key of, for improvement is always the exchange of experience between different countries. And so I'm very inspired also for new projects, maybe together. Thank you very much, Professor Petinella. Thank to you. Thanks, Thank Ricardo. you so much, Ricardo. Uh, well, let's perhaps listen then to um, Valentino, who also wants, wanted to make a statement or raise a question. Please, Valentino. Thank you, Professor Petanella, for your presentation. It was really inspiring and interesting. My question was related to the examples that you mentioned. You mentioned several success cases of organic and fair trade certification for edible non-wood forest products. And my question is related if if you think that these schemes are also proving successful for non-edible non-wood forest products or there uh, they fail to attract end consumers, which might be more interest to and more appealed by edible non-wood forest products. And I think this question links also to the question that Anastasia Timoshina posed uh, later on about uh, uh, how to segment segmentate uh, sub-consumers of uh, non-wood forest products. Thank you. A uh, good question. A uh, good question. I, I will need a bit more time to go deeper on that because uh, differentiation through marks, uh, labels uh, is an important technique and is used by European small scale producer, hmm? uh, but is used also by larger companies. Hmm? You know that the leading company in the cork sector is FSC certified. Hmm? But uh, you, you know that we have also uh, uh, forest owner uh, producing or offering uh, mushroom, wild mushroom in Spain that are PFC certified. Huh? So you see uh, the instrument itself is neutral, it's not uh, is a, a instrument uh, suited specifically for large operator or for small scale operators. And uh, here is a matter of entrepreneurship and uh, dynamics 
uh, of the market. This is why the public support, the governance uh, instruments, uh, the activity that can be done at national level to support the most small scale operators, as we will discuss uh, uh, today, and as already Alvaro and Ignazio uh, have mentioned, are key elements to keep the balance between uh, small scale and large uh, companies, also in this uh, sector. I, I don't know, I, I, I tried, it's a tentative answer to your very complex question. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Petanella. In the meantime, we received basically the backing from uh, Mrs. Patricia Shanley uh, on your suggestion to refer to uh, non-wood forest products as wild forest products. So uh, you are clearly getting support for your suggestion. In the meantime, we also got an indication that uh, Mr. Chamberlain would like to uh, bring up a question. So, Mr. Chamberlain, the floor is yours. Good morning, Professor. Can you hear me okay? So, you were, you're advocating uh, focusing on the personal use and micro-enterprise development of these products, but I wonder how one, how do you regulate and control the harvest of those? Um, and how do you report on the, the amount of the economic and ecological impacts of those, of those small, diverse products? And then what do you do about the other 75% of the harvesting that's going on that's for large commodities and activities like that? Uh, at least three questions in one, <laughs> so uh, quite complex. Uh, I, I, I will try to, to answer the first question specifically. Um, I, I don't think that we are really facing huge problem for regulating uh, the harvesting level, harvesting activity. In Europe, especially in the forest sector, and I will say especially in Southern Europe, we have a consolidated tradition of introducing a quite massive set of rules and regulation in order to deal with the problem of scarcity. We have so many rules that sometimes we are thinking that a bit of more liberalization uh, could help uh, the, the, the sector. So uh, many countries are starting from Italy and uh, Spain are introducing, for example, system of uh, permit picking, both uh, for mushroom, uh, uh, for uh, berries, uh, for uh, truffles and so on. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure that if I have understood uh, Currently, uh, your reference to uh, the 75% uh, uh, of the um, of, of, of the products that maybe uh, you are referring to the massive import uh, of non-wood forest products in Europe. This is true. I think uh, we cannot stop it. We should maybe introduce uh, some. Uh, uh, system of control, you know that we are speaking about introducing a zero deforestation label uh, for especially products uh, imported from tropical countries that may be under risk of degrading the forest, uh, uh, the forest uh, ecosystems there and uh, damaging the, the local communities. I think that uh, if we, and probably because there is a strong commitment in this direction, we will go on with this idea, we should be careful and have a, a fair uh, set of instruments dealing with all set of products and not only working on few selected uh, major products like meat and uh, uh, soybean or... Uh, Palm oil, palm oil. Okay, um, I think we, I'm looking at the time and perhaps we should uh, slightly proceed with this. There is a short question from Sven Walters still coming up. So if okay for you, I would like to briefly give the word to Sven. And then I suggest that any remaining questions or even uh, questions that uh, come up later in this session or right now, please keep them, keep, keep sending us the questions. 
we might have some additional time for debate and questions and answers towards the end of this uh, third session, right? But Sven Walter, perhaps um, you wanted to make a statement or have a short question, please. Yeah, Go just ahead. a short um, input. Thanks, Stephen. And um, thank you, David, for the excellent presentation. There many issues to be discussed. Just three quick points from my side. One, and also to echo what Anastasia mentioned from traffic in the chat, is basically when we talked yesterday about data and we mentioned decision makers and investors, I think we should not forget the consumers and how can we help there to raise you know, awareness and provide information. I think that's a point actually we should really flag. I also fully agree to your proposal more thinking about wild forest products. I mean, if they are wild, semi-wild, I think for the outside world, it doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. it's for the communication and from FAO side, we are now working on a wild food program. So it goes into the right direction and maybe you mentioned these 500 small products. I think we still need some flagship products also for communication because that is where we can have a, a simple message. And sometimes what we talk about non for forest world is getting too complex. So we need to be clearer. And the last point linked to a quick question is when you mentioned the design as being maybe not part of the value chain, but it's important when we talk about also how to contribute to a bioeconomy and maybe think about how can we support small scale enterprises or others, you know, to really to address the issue that through the better and the better communicated maybe design, you know, we have also better market opportunities. Again, thanks a lot for the brilliant presentation. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you for the question. Can we have a short reaction from your side, uh, Professor? Yes, sure. I, fully agree. I fully agree with uh, Sven. Uh, uh, Sven points, uh, only to add the small uh, elements of uh, consideration. Uh, maybe you have uh, 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 catch that I was uh, referring uh, uh, to rubber and uh, to Arabic gum, uh, because uh, these are two uh, important products that we are importing uh, without any consideration about the environmental social impacts in the producing country. Mm. So you are, uh, you are right. We need also um, flagged products for uh, in information. And you are by sure right when you stress the importance of design. Of course, that's my, it, it, it was a simplification. Design of the products, think for example, to the problem of packaging is very important. And what we have to do is uh, to support the design of the final products uh, and not only uh, to support uh, the processing activity, uh, in the producing country, in the developing world, in such a way that uh, they will be able to sell at good prices, qualified products, and not to sell a raw material where all, almost of the all added value is taken by Europe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm afraid I have to intervene here because I'm looking at the time and I really would like to, to offer the upcoming speakers uh, the time they, they had uh, um, been given to. But thank you so much, Professor Petanella, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. There are lots of reactions coming in. So it's definitely a topic that is bringing up lots of comments. There are even questions coming in. So I suggest that we take and analyze uh, all remarks, all comments that have come in. And if there is time left at the end of the session, uh, I think all of us would be more than happy to return uh, and, and treat some of these questions. For the time being, let's continue with our program. And the next step or the next dish, if you like, of the menu for uh, this third session uh, of our policy forum is a little bit similar to what we have been doing yesterday. So the people that have attended the second session know that we had a session basically or a slot in which we were handling a couple of presentations of a special style. So it is called the Pecha Kucha style. What is special about it? Well, first of all, it's short. The speakers know, get only six minutes, 40 seconds, and they know this, they have to respect this. Second, it's much more graphical. So the whole idea is to bring in a story rather than more data, more uh, uh, scientific uh, elements, so to speak, and they have been uh, they have been warned about this. So yesterday we had several speakers that managed to respect the time and the style of the presentation, and they have 
given they have been given access to the Hall of Fame of incredible Pechacucha speakers. Let's see how the speakers for today will handle the same challenge. And we are going to make the tour of four Mediterranean countries, Italy, Spain, Greece, and Turkey. Let us start with Italy. And from Italy, we have Enrico Vidale. He is a known expert on Longwood Forest politics, a well-appreciated speaker as well, I, may, I must say. He's linked to the University of Padova in Italy. Uh, and he will bring a story, if you like, on tax reform on wild growing non-wood forest products or non-wood products in Italy, lesson learned and new opportunities for the forest sector. Enrico, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Steven. Thanks, uh, uh, Effie, for the uh, chance that I have to, to explain some little concept. I will be quite brief uh, and very, I, I hope not too technical, but uh, from the theory that Davide shows, uh, we step on the ground uh, where the company lives. So just to, to, to show you, when we talk about non-wood forest product, we have to divide clearly in two big area. That is farm activity that are under a farm, let's say, um, legal status and commercial activity that is uh, connected with the wild gathering. For, exam for example, the same products can come from two different systems, and this matter a lot uh, for the company in terms of taxation. So think about uh, mushroom production in a farm and a mushroom collection in the forest. So the type of invoice, the type of uh, documents that a farmer produces based on invoice, but on the other hand, we have something like uh, 20 types of different transaction typology in Europe. And this typology of transaction allow you to have data or not. For instance, when policymakers touch some key issue on the value chain, something like uh, harvesting limitation or uh, uh, heavy taxation applied to certain commodities, like uh, in this case, truffle, you may have a dramatic effect on the market. For instance, this uh, shows the collapse of uh, Italian uh, uh, trade on truffle just uh, for the, applic the wrong application of uh, taxation issue on the supply chain. So, for instance, uh, we start from this problem and we start to understand the data behind this uh, dramatic effect. And after, let's say, a couple of years of discussion, we simply say, okay, guys, let's copy where the things works better that's uh, linked with the taxation applied to farm. We add uh, some special category for non-professional pickers, and the effect uh, was the introduction of two typology of new pickers, uh, see, uh, taxation applied to two typology of pickers that in, let's say, couple of uh, months uh, move uh, the entire system from five people that declare to collect uh, truffle and mushroom up to uh, 15,000, so in just a few months, uh, and from 16 companies up to uh, 1,200 companies in six months after the application. So it means uh, that if we touch the right uh, teams, the, the right topics, uh, and we um, understand the problem of the company, the company reply directly to what they need. For instance, uh, in pharma system, they just need uh, to have uh, this uh, very strange term uh, that is standard production that introduce uh, semi-wild products, uh, something like cultivated truffle as well introduce uh, uh, inside the common agriculture policy the cultivated forest so what they cultivate for uh, wild or semi-wild forest products and of course uh, the huge tremendous huge problem of added value taxes that is totally unbalanced in europe as well if we look on the right hand side so commercial part uh, Taxation issue is a dramatic issue. So think about uh, what happened in the fisheries. The fisher goes in the sea. They are wild fish, uh, but they are considered farmer. 
just uh, this movement allow, uh, allow this uh, type of uh, category to have uh, extremely low taxation. Why should we extend to wild gathering? Or even better, create a new segment of the uh, uh, fiscal directive that we have in Europe for this special category. Think about a gypsy that has to declare taxes. So in a paperless economy and uh, without a formal address to, to send the invoice or uh, whatever that is linked to the formal economy. And as well, apply smart bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, in the economic uh, uh, point of view, it's really a tragedy. Well, that's all on my side, Stephen. I hope uh, I respect uh, the timing. And uh, if you have questions, here I am. Excellent, uh, Enrico. You, you did more than respect your timing. It's uh, something like five minutes, which is uh, probably a world, a world record for a Pecha Kucha style of presentation. Thank you so much, um, Enrico. Now, stay with us, please. But let's immediately proceed to the next speaker to keep the pace. Huh? And at, at the end of this session, we will for sure have time for any questions for your side. So let's move on. After Italy, let's go a little bit west side and go to Spain. And from Spain, we have Mr. Fernandez from Mito, Miteco. And Miteco is the Ministry for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge of Spain. And he will bring a presentation on labor and fiscal policies supporting resin holdings in Spain. Mr. Fernandez, if you're ready, the time is yours. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, oh, it's perfect. Thank you. I'm going to share my presentation with all of you. Okay, can you see? Yes, we see it and now full screen mode. One moment. The presentation mode, yes. Okay, it's okay now. Yes, I think it's good. You can, uh, you can. Have Perfect. It. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to talk about labor and fiscal policy supporting resin, resin holdings in Spain. First of all, resin. Maybe we are talking about very different non-wood forest products. No, maybe resin and cork, very wild, and the other, the other side, maybe pig mushrooms and and fruits and other things, but. In this case, we are talking about resin, no? It's a little different. Um, first of all, uh, a brief resign about uh, resin activity in Spain. Uh, modern resin activity began towards uh, 1850, hmm? long time ago. Forest administration developed in uh, management plans and harvesting condition regulations towards uh, 1880. So we have a lot of experience about, about that. And, and also about the harvesting and, and planification of the, of the harvesting. Maximum production of resin in Spain was in uh, 1960. It was around 60,000 tons. Uh, in 1990, uh, uh, decline and almost disappear the production of resin in Spain. Lately, around 2010, uh, the activity recovered, and maybe with because three new industrial plants uh, were, were built in, in Spain, and this produced 1,000 new resin workers. Hmm? From two, 2010 to, to uh, nowadays, well, the production of the resin in Spain was around 10,000 tons hmm, every year. So this is the context. In Spain, we have two models, maybe for uh, two types of resin holdings. Hmm? It, this is very important because Enrico also mentioned that. No? Maybe we, we are more uh, uh, closer to, to agriculture than uh, pickers. Mm? 
but the two models are forest owners, private or public, vale, this is important, who manage pine forests and sell the right to tap the pines. Mm? This is the first model. And the second is the other, the other side, no? resin tapers who pay an annual rent for the pines. Of course, sorry, it's important uh, to, to notice that uh, these recent tapers works, work in, during March and two October in the year. Mm? It's telling the utilities, the barking, tapping and collecting. It's a lot of activities they have to do for harvest the, the, the resign. Mm? Pine resign workers' conditions uh, is a, a, a key point no, here. Mm? Uh, nowadays, resin workers sign an annual commercial contract with the resin industry. The role of resin industry here is very, very important, mm? a difference with other uh, non wood forest products. Some resin workers, of course, are integrated in cooperatives, but uh, most, all most of them are working uh, self-employed. Mm? Around one third of, the, of them combine the resin activity with others. Mm? But this is important because I remember that they only work with resin during March to October. Uh, of course, they need to associate it because they, uh, they have to ask for fiscal and labor improvements, like Enrico said before, because the con labor conditions are not so good for, uh, for living of, of this activity. So it's important the association and also it's very important to, to try association uh, inter-branch organizations. Why? Because the role of the industry here is very important and we need to connect the industry with the uh, resin workers. Mm -hmm. In 2014, uh, in this context, uh, the government of Spain uh, passed the plan for the socioeconomic activism, activism of the forest sector. This, this is a, a key plan that includes 80 measures for, for timber, but also for non for, uh, forest products. Uh, nine of these uh, measures are related to resin. Hmm? You can find here the, the nine uh, measures. Uh, I want to underline four of them. The first one I mentioned before, is about the standard contracts between producer and industry. The second one is integration of activities uh, because the seasonality no, of the activity. And, and this is a very important point I, I want to, to, to say again. The other one is improve the labor and fiscal regime for resin workers. This is the, the, the topic of this presentation. And of course, a very important training. No? We are working on these four uh, measures and we uh, we have results. No? We read the national government recognize the resin workers like uh, managers of agricultural holdings no? related to Enrico said before. This is very important because they have a new regime of taxes. So for, for instance, uh, bad regimes in agriculture is a, a way from compensate no, the, the what they pay. So uh, it's very, very important uh, reform. Also in the labor uh, aspect, uh, in 2015, the Ministry of Employment of Spain created a special labor regime for resin workers. This is also very important because of the seasonality. No? Uh, I remember they work only in this uh, activity from March to uh, November, October, November. Time. Yeah, of course, uh, I'm going to, to finish with the conclusions. Integration of activities in rural areas is the most important topic. Overcome decisionality, resin holdings to protect the environment, but also heritage, cultural heritage. And of course, promote the transition to the economy because these products are uh, the, the, in the, in, in the key of the, of the problem. We need from, to pass from traditional rural workers to professionals. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Mr. Fernandez. It's, it's a challenge to bring a presentation in less than seven minutes. And we, we really appreciate that you wanted to be part of this and take up the challenge. Let's keep the rhythm, ladies and gentlemen, and proceed by switching to Greece. And we have a speaker, Vasilis Katsupas, from Canela and uh, Garifalo, Fisa Sakori, in Greece. I hope I pronounced that somehow relatively correctly. And he's going to deliver a presentation on ecotourism in wild mushroom sector in Greece. Mr. Katsupas, the floor is yours. Okay, hi. So this is Vasily. Um, I'm a business owner in Zagori, which is a mountainous region in northwestern Greece. Uh, Zagori is a UNESCO geopark uh, site as well as a proposed World Heritage Site. And so it's one of the least populated and developed regions in Europe. Um, so economic activity in the past has been mostly farming, but tourism has become more important in recent years, especially in the last decade. So in 2005, I started uh, my business, which is a, a small restaurant that specializes in mushrooms. Um, we grow and we collect uh, more than 30 different uh, types of mushrooms, as well as um, wild herbs, berries and fruit from the forest of the area. Uh, it has not been a very easy process, uh, as one of uh, the main challenges we've had to face was uh, people's uh, fear of mushrooms. In, uh, in fact, um, uh, one could say Greece is one of the most uh, mycophobic societies in Europe. Um, so we had to invest a lot of time and effort in order to overcome that challenge, to convince people um, that uh, we are a safe place. Uh, quite frankly, in the beginning, we had uh, quite a few people uh, walk out when they found out we serve mushrooms. Uh, so, as a result of this, our restaurant, in a way, has become a bit of a museum or gallery or school of sorts, where people can expect, if they wish, to learn about mushrooms as part of the environment, uh, about their role in the ecosystem, as well as about their uh, gastronomic and medicinal even value. Uh, so, we, we are not alone in doing this anymore. In the last decade, uh, dozens of uh, microphilic uh, clubs have sprung all over the country, organizing uh, mushroom hunting trips and festivals as a means to raise awareness and increase uh, knowledge uh, for the general public. Um, we have a, a, such a festival organized uh, annually in Zagori for over a decade now, and it's well attended uh, with several hundreds of people. And uh, as a result of the synergy, uh, we have also benefited and we're well known as a mushroom uh, themed restaurant. Um, we, uh, an important issue we face has to do with the lack of trained mushroom collectors. Uh, there isn't uh, yet any organized uh, training or accreditation program for wild mushroom collection. Um, we have developed a working relationship with a small group of uh, experienced and uh, knowledgeable collectors and uh, have focused on uh, training them uh, or uh, as well as training our kitchen staff to follow uh, very rigorous and uh, labor intensive proofing uh, process to ensure uh, the safety um, of the mushrooms that we serve in our restaurant. Uh, education has become an important part of our work outside the restaurant as well. Uh, we often organize mushroom safaris taking people to nearby forests not so much to uh, collect mushrooms uh, or to teach them how to collect mushrooms, but mostly to provide them with a more uh, profound learning experience on site by explaining the ecological role of fungi in the forest and um, completely changing the way they view the world, basically. Uh, these guided uh, ecotourist activities are an increasingly important value-added service to our customers and uh, they enabled us to generate extra income for our uh, associate collectors and uh, also they function as a natural uh, value multiplier for our gastronomic reputation. Uh, we're not the only ones doing it either. Uh, several hotels and activity organizers are also offering similar services. Over time, we have enriched our menu to include more wild plants and berries and local produce and wines 
developing continuously food and wine pairing ideas to highlight a new sort of uh, local gastronomy that is based more in the natural environment. Um, so over the last uh, 15 years of our operation, we've had uh, a, a positive economic impact on our local community. We provide uh, several full and part-time jobs to people working at the restaurant in our mushroom farm, where we grow shiitake mushrooms, as well as to collectors and uh, guides. Um, back in uh, 2005, when we started, we were the only restaurant in the region serving wild mushrooms. You couldn't find wild mushrooms served anywhere else. Um, but now pretty much every other uh, restaurant, every restaurant in the region has included one or more um, mushroom dishes in on their menus. And uh, we tend to perceive this as an accomplishment and uh, a measure of our uh, uh, success. A compliment, someone might say as well. Um, Yet, uh, one of the things we are concerned is that as more people become uh, interested in wild mushrooms and more restaurants include them in their menus, um, accidental poisonings due to uh, less careful or knowledgeable colleagues may prove to have a detrimental effect on our business. Um, moreover, we are concerned that uh, the existing legal uh, framework is, uh, is too weak or outdated and needs to be improved in order to ensure uh, more sustainable uh, uh, environmental practices and uh, a better economic uh, uh, balance. Uh, to counter all these, uh, we have been collaborating in an ongoing discussion and efforts with uh, other colleagues um, in the industry as well as some local academics uh, to develop a more comprehensive uh, framework in Greece regarding the collection of wild mushrooms. Excellent, excellent, Mr. Katsupas. I think this was a classical example of a Pecha Kucha presentation with lots of uh, extremely beautiful pictures and well within the time. I think I'm, I'm uh, really impressed. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, just let's keep up the rhythm, let's keep up the pace and conclude our tour of the Mediterranean area. And let's take a look at Turkey and to share on, or share a story from Turkey. We have Mr. Ismail Bilen with us. He is from Karfu, that is the foundation of the people caring for future. He's also with the Ministry of Agriculture and Forests of Turkey and he will bring a story on the national programs for non-wood forest products in Turkey. Mr. Belen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Can you see my screen? I think it's okay. It's, we see your screen, but it's not yet in presentation, Modus. Yes. Yes, this is perfect. Yeah. Uh, my presentation will be about national programs of for non-wood forest products in Turkey. Uh, if I give you a few numbers, because these numbers are important for some policy. Uh, in Turkey, all the forests are managed and governed by the government. So th this is important for uh, policy tools. And uh, we have about 7 million people living in or around the forests. Uh, if you see the policy tools, uh, four items of Turkish constitutions are about forest and farmers. Uh, and also uh, for forest villagers and cooperatives, which are very relevant to non forest product. <clears throat> And at the top, we have organic agriculture lab. Uh, it is the same EU organic regulations. And this regulation says now forest product are harvesting products from nature area and <clears throat> uh, something like that. And we have veterinary services uh, law. And also, of course, we have forest law. We see the uh, stakeholders, which are very important for, for the sector. Of course, we have uh, presidency, 
And under presidency, we have some uh, policy councils like Council of Health and Food Policies and Council of Local Administration Policies. Also, we have presence of strategy and budget, which is responsible for national development plans. Uh, besides the uh, councils, uh, we have some ministries which are responsible for non forest products, mainly Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, Minister of Trade, Minister of Treasury and Finance, and Minister of Industry and Technology. The main responsible organization for non-wood forest product is GDO Forest under Minister of Agriculture and Forest. And we established Department of Non-Wood Forest Product very recently in 2011. Apart from this uh, GDO Forestry, we have GDO Plant Production, uh, we have uh, GDO Animal Husbandry and GDO Food and Control uh, under the Ministry of Agriculture. Of course, some other institutions are important for the sector, like Turkish Statistical Institute, Turkish Standards uh, and Trademark, and Turkish Patents Institute. Also, like the other countries, we have, uh, we have uh, other stakeholders like NGOs, universities, private sector. For example, Turkish Association of Beekeepers has uh, more than 70,000 members. And this is, uh, in Turkey, we have special uh, forest product like pine honey, uh, which is about 20% of uh, all Turkish pine honey production. If you talk about some regulation and communics, sure, we have forest management regulation, which is cover all aspects. And for now, forest product, we have recreational area communics uh, and communicate on inventory, planning, production, harvesting, and sales of uh, Nanwood forest product, which is very uh, new. Uh, we have honey forest communique, ecotourism, and truffle communique very, very recently. For the implementation side, uh, we have action plans for uh, national scale, uh, like resin, bileaf, blueberry, truffle, pine honey, etc. And uh, for the specific area and product, we have utilization plans. These plans cover about 10,000 hectares area or more or less. Uh, and we started to prepare investor guidelines for private sector. Recently, uh, under the letter of agreement signed by FAO and Chamber of Forest Engineers, uh, we prepared some reports, deliverables, namely Nano Forest Product Assessment Report of Turkey, Policy Report of Turkey, and special report for pine honey, bileaf, leaf, chestnut, resin, and truffle mushrooms. Uh, we also prepared technical guidelines of selected uh, uh, non forest products and uh, we prepared value chain uh, recommendations for this product. If I give you some um, figures, some findings from this uh, letter of agreement, in, 19, in 2019, the contribution of non forest product to economy is about 1 billion uh, US dollars. And uh, Turkey export about 200 million US, uh, US dollars to mainly European countries and China. And the contribution to forest villages is about uh, more than 100 million US dollars. And the working, the forest villages working for non-wood forest product is about 25,000. Uh, this number for wood production is 150,000. Uh, as a whole, non-wood forest product sector makes an economic contribution about half a million people. Uh, this includes working in the fields, working for drying processes, uh, making the final product or semi-finished product, packer, seller, or, or, and family members. 
I give you an example about the price of chestnuts, uh, Turkey is the main producers uh, in the Europe actually uh, for chestnuts. Uh, last year it was about 70,000 tons and the annual contribution more than 100 million US dollars. Uh, Turkey exported to Italy, France and Spain. If you look at the price, it is only $2 at the harvesting site. At the markets, five if we prepare candy chestnuts, 15 and if you uh, have chestnut honey, it is 40 US dollars. Uh, this is a good example about the price. Uh, thank you for listening to me and I'm ready to reply all the questions. Steven? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Belen, for your uh, nice presentation, giving a very interesting and valuable overview of uh, what the situation is in, uh, in Turkey. Um, I'm looking at the time. What I would like to suggest is that we keep on, that we keep on uh, with our schedule and that if any questions are coming on, of course, to any of the speakers, uh, but uh, especially also for this uh, people that have gone through this uh, Pecha Kucha experience, uh, we will deal with them at the end of this session. Now, to thank the persons that have done and had uh, or, or were willing to go through this uh, or take up this Pecha Kucha challenge, I think Gerard has something to, to, uh, to show them. Gerard? I don't know what you're seeing me. Gerard? Okay, it seems we're having, yes. Yes, a moment, Stephen, let me see if I can help. That's okay. In the meantime, while you're dealing with uh, the hiccup, uh, I will continue to basically ask people to please don't wait. If you have questions, don't wait until the end of the session. Huh? Uh, you can always uh, send them in and as they're coming sure. in, we're going to uh, deal with them. Yes, I see Gerard is ready now. Gerard, please. These are the hands that this is, this is our way of thanking the people that have uh, taken up the Pecha Kucha challenge because I, I, as you will understand, it was not easy for them to restrict themselves to this six minutes, 40 seconds. Right, now, by way of interlude, we're going to see a short video on chestnuts uh, and then transition towards basically discussing uh, key actions. Yeah, are we ready for the video? Getting there. I'll give it one more. A little bit more time, it seems. Buongiorno a tutti, sono Emanuele Piani, castanicoltore, agricoltore in comune di San Godenzo, in, in Appennino, quindi nella nostra montagna. Io rappresento un mondo che dieci anni fa, quindici anni fa, pensavamo fosse in via d'estinzione perché eh, alla fine la produzione del marrone eh, soprattutto e anche della farina di marroni aveva avuto una contrazione in negativo avevamo dei, dei produttori con un'età molto alta e eh, un prodotto che riusciva a, male, diciamo, a caratterizzarsi sul mercato grazie all'IGP e al lavoro svolto da castanicoltori e, e all'attività all del consorzio il marrone è stato nuovamente riscoperto Oggi abbiamo un ritorno in, nella castanicoltura qui eh, diciamo in Toscana, comunque in provincia di Firenze, dove c'è questa denominazione importante, Marrone Mugelli GP, abbiamo un ritorno importante di giovani. 
il prezzo diciamo, del, del prodotto si è adeguato eh, al, agli standard di oggi, è una coltura che ci caratterizza molto, caratterizza molto il paesaggio, è una coltura dove la mano buona dell'uomo si vede, è una coltura che identifica fortemente il nostro, il nostro territorio, tant'è che anche all'interno dell'Associazione della Foresta Modello dove siamo soci cerchiamo di portare avanti appunto le finalità eh, di questa coltivazione e siamo eh, molto fiduciosi che anche avversità come il cinifide del castagno o altre avversità eh, de, legate ai cambiamenti climatici eh, ci vedranno alla fine o comunque vedranno le nostre piante alla fine eh, sopravvivere e continuare a darci questo fantastico e meraviglioso frutto. Excellent. Well, this was just one of these short videos we have. We have a range of these and every now and then we will inject these in the program as this is a way to, to create a kind of an interludium, if you know, uh, if you understand. So and um, my apologies for the, the short technical hiccup we had. Uh, I can assure you that the team uh, from European Forest Institute, they are juggling with uh, so many things to keep this uh, going smooth. And I, I think they are doing a wonderful job, but that doesn't mean that every now and then something can happen. Now, let's see. Yesterday, after these presentations, to, better get an, to, to get a better understanding of the topic, we made a transition towards discussing what needs to happen, actions. Right, And it's exactly the same thing that we would like to do now, but then obviously actions that relate to the session of the day or uh, actions that are relevant to support non-wood forest products. And as the first speaker of that, I would like to introduce you Julia Muir from FAO. She has been quite intensively uh, involved in the preparations to this uh, policy forum. And we are extremely grateful that she's with us today and she's going to present us key action on transparency and visibility of non-wood forest products. And for the other participants, please keep sending your questions uh, uh, even during the presentation so that we can have a look in the meantime. Uh, Mrs. Moore, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm assuming you can see this and hear me, otherwise it's, just... It's excellent, microphone is there, the screen is there, so you are uh, set to go, please. Super. Um, great. Okay, so I'm going to bring you back to the, the white paper and key actions on transparency and visibility. Um, oh no. Sorry, my screen froze. Okay, I think I might have to do this this way because my slides aren't moving. That's okay. It's sufficiently visible, so it's uh, no, it's clear. Okay. Um, so we heard a lot already. Um, I had no doubts that Davide would cover most of the 3.3.2 on traceability and innovation. Um, so I'll go through that uh, very quickly and I'll focus on 3.3.1, which is more about improving visibility of non-wood forest products. Um, also as FAO, um, it's embedded in our constitution, article one, to improve data and information. So to some extent we, we have a responsibility. So I'll, I'll focus most, mostly on that and, and touch very briefly on the other key actions we've identified with partners. Um, just on the, the rationale, so why is this is important? Um, we know a lot about the agricultural sector. We have very good data in FALSTEP, for example, on. Um, conventional foods, the, the usual 12 crops more or less that cover 98% of our food needs. This um, forest sector, especially when we talk about non-wood forest products, um, very little data. There's a reason why we call it hidden harvest, invisible trade. Um, so we definitely need to do better. Um, traffic has an interesting statistic on how the majority of plants in trade are actually wild harvested and we talk a lot about evidence-based decision-making, but there's a the whole sector that we actually know very little about. I wouldn't say we know nothing about it. There are good examples. Um, Turkey, we heard from Turkey before us. They have great data on wood forest products, so it really depends. But I think uh, globally we can do um, much better. This is a recent study on what we know about conventionally reported foods. So 
um, it actually showed that more than 25% of food production um, uh, is comprised of these hitting, missing, underreported foods. So that also includes non-wood forest products. So um, that's a pretty significant proportion of food production, uh, food production that we don't know enough about, um, which brings us to the key actions we identified with partners. Um, one of these key actions is establishing, establishing high relevance non-wood forest product species. Um, so priority species, Van Tom mentioned this in 2003, so it, it's nothing particularly new, but I think it's time to move on this. Um, and I can't stress enough working with um, existing processes such as the harmonized system. This is a system that over 200 countries use to collect data. So it might not be ideal, it might not be perfect, it might only show a small part uh, of what we're looking for, but I I would say, let's use it, it's there and countries already use it. Let's build capacities to use it well. Um, in the last edition of the Harmonized System, we at FAO introduced 10 new codes on non-wood forest products. It's a start, it's, it's what uh, the timber or the, the working group on uh, timber products did many years ago. Um, we can't keep saying there's no data, we need to start somewhere. So this is a great place to start. And now we're working on the 2027 edition um, and proposing new codes. And um, this part here, it's not in the, the key actions right now, but I, I would like to throw it out there. There exists an intersecretariat working group on uh, forest statistics, which is actually all about timber and wood. Why not a working group on non-wood forest product statistics or a chapter of that working group? Um, FAL can't do it alone. So this is sort of a call um, to see if we can work together on this. Um, and we, did mention before non-wood forest product the uh, flagships i think as ben might have brought it up um there are flagships we can all name pretty quickly when it comes to wildlife not for non-wood forest products so again getting back to that communication issue can we come up with i think traffic called it the wild dozen so representative spe uh, species or products that can really help us communicate with consumers or decision makers about non-wood forest products um so start um establishing those key key priority products. Um, terminology, there's been a lot of movement in the in the um, chat box and after Davide's um, excellent presentation on what terms we should use. Um, I, I don't wanna dwell on this too long, but I think it's important to make a distinction between um, gathering official statistics and con communicating with consumers. I think um, some of these processes like the HS, they're very difficult to change. So it's important to work with them. It's important to um, improve what's there. So I would say, um, you know, this here, uh, I apologize for my screen, but um, this is what uh, fisheries did. We, we can all talk about aquaculture. We know what that means. Um, and they divide it into categories. I think the same needs to be done for, for non-wood. So we can, we can still use wild forest products, but we need to recognize that there are other categories too. And again, um, let's use statistical processes that, that do exist. Um, and but this is just one small part of the picture. It's not just about codes. Um, there's actually a lot of codes in these systems that are there, but they are not used by countries. Gamarabic, for example, it's there. Um, and it's actually in national, some of the national databases, but there's no reporting in these international statistical processes. So there's also a huge amount of capacity building that needs, needs to occur. Um, moving on. Um, yesterday, Patricia mentioned the staggering contribution of a lot of these non-wood forest products to food security and nutrition. And a lot of this is entirely unaccounted for. Um, so I think while international statistics and official statistics is a good start, we need to do much better. And this here is also a huge opportunity to, to improve data collection. These are surveys that, um, dietary surveys that already take place in um, hundreds of countries. So can we um, latch onto these existing surveys, include questions on non-wood, um, we're starting to do this with our nutrition department. In fact, these um, guidelines were just published on capturing um, wild foods in dietary surveys. Um, the standard surveys that take place right now, they're called 24-hour recalls. So that the word itself says that in, 20, um, in the last 24 hours, um, what people eat. And of course, a lot of seasonal foods, like a lot of uh, wild foods, are not captured by these surveys. Um, having said that, we can work with these existing tools, um, improve them, because again, they already take place in, in lots of countries, so it's, it's a matter of working with them and trying to adapt um, the survey. So that's, that's a huge uh, action that I think, well, FAO we're already doing, and we're actually working on a guidance note as well on improving these uh, 
dietary surveys to capture a lot of these foods. Um, so I think that um, in itself can be a key action to integrate into the official statistics gathering that we're already uh, working on. And then complementing this information by targeted sectoral surveys. We've heard a lot about the work by Lovereach and, and, and Padova on, um, on uh, through the EU Star Tree uh, project, fantastic data gathered there. Um, I guess the key challenge is how do we make it systematic and how do we make it global? Because I think it's, um, again, uh, really great data that came out. Um, it's specific, it's sectoral, but how do we replicate? So I think those are some of the things we need to think about. But they, they can certainly complement some of the, um, the, the actions I mentioned before. And then uh, throughout these past couple of days, we really heard a lot from different sectors, quark, mushrooms, um, chestnuts. On um, There's so much data at people's fingertips. We really need to find a way. To, to, to create a, a working group on these statistics um, because that can certainly complement a lot of the official data collection taking place. Um, and I'll go through the, the last ones. I know I'm running out of time quite quickly. Davide again mentioned so much on traceability of Rico as well and labeling. Um, one thing I would uh, stress is more needs to be done on standards. Um, at FAO we have Codex Alimentarius, for example, very few non-wood forest products feature there. Um, honey, gum arabic, shea butter, and Brazil nuts are, the, are some of the few, but especially now um, with concerned uh, food safety concerns when it comes to wild foods, I think it's an important um, and much needed um, topic to address. So standards on, on wild foods. Um, and finally, uh, again, most of this was already mentioned, but uh, especially through the incred uh, incredible knowledge repository, so many of these best practices are, com are coming out. So how can we continue um, and, and, and to house these in a place that, you know, what happens after incredible, where do these best practices go? So make sure, File, for example, has the Teka platform, which houses a lot of these practices for small agricultural producers. There's a beekeeping, uh, beekeeping group. There's not a non wood forest product group. So that's potentially another space, another platform that can be used. Um, and then innovation, there's a lot of incredible things happening. Citizen science, for example, this here, um, you can't really say it well, but it's, it's what's happening um, in Institute in Italy um, using QR codes, so tracking honey from the hive to the market. These things are happening. Um, we, need to, we need to see how to apply this also for non-wood. Um, I'll let Sarah continue with some of the other key actions, but um, hopefully I didn't take up too much time, Stephen. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Excellent. No, no, Julia, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for the very nice examples you've given, not only pointing towards policy actions, but also giving uh, very interesting examples of what's going on because the world evolves, right? So with the citizen science projects, etc., there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, going on. But you're right, let's uh, first hear also Sarah Maltoni's contributions. I will immediately introduce her. And then if there are any actions coming in, uh, consider this. So this then might be uh, actions, I mean questions. So this might be uh, questions to, to either of, of you. Okay, I would like to say to the attendees, if you see a question in the Q&A that you like, you can upvote the question or you can post questions yourself. Now, switching to Sara Maltoni, she is the head of the Forest Value Chains and Cooperation Office at Regional Forest Agency for Land and the Environment of Sardinia, so that is Forestas, and Forestas is one of the consortium partners of the incredible project. Uh, Sarah is a well-appreciated partner that has been one of the persons driving uh, the organization of this uh, policy forum. So Sarah, could you please give us a wrap up on the policy actions needed to secure successful non-wood forest products value chains? Please, Sarah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Good. So thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everybody, for being here, and especially thank you to the speakers that have uh, given their presentation today. Very, very inspiring. So my, my aim in this last speech of this session three is to provide a wrap up, a summary, let's say, of the policy actions that we've been discussing this morning. Um, and to do that in the frame of the white paper that has been a stepping stone uh, to this policy forum and that has been mentioned several times. 
uh, in this white paper, the actions are summarizing four main blocks. The block on securing conservation and supply of non-wood forest products has been addressed yesterday, whereas today we've been speaking of building competitive and equitable value chains. But also through the presentation of Julia, we have uh, touched the issue of transparency, data and information flow. So let's see uh, what actions make these, um, these blocks. Building competitive and equitable value chains uh, encompass three basic domains, developing innovative place-based value chains, but also securing innovation in the field of fiscal and labor policies and promoting a greater equitability along the value chains with a fair share of profits, especially for primary producers. Innovative and place-based value chains can be achieved by several means. Uh, and all of them have been mentioned by the previous presentations. Uh, we have mentioned the importance of formalizing the relationships between the landowners and the collectors of non-wood forest products. For example, picking permits have proven very successful uh, in the field of mushrooms, and that has been told for Italy, but also in the case of Castilla y Leon, uh, but also the uh, agreements between um, uh, forest owners and pickers of medicinal and aromatic plants in the case of eucalyptus still in Spain in Andalusia. Uh, all these agreements, they improve access to the resource, they provide economic returns to the forest owner, they, uh, they allow control of harvesting levels and therefore make traceability uh, possible, counteracting the grey markets. Uh, also, it ensures uh, the continuity of supply for industries, and in the case of edibles, they favour uh, food safety. So formalisation is one step uh, and improves access to the resource, and access, uh, improving access is particularly relevant in public forest. We've heard that in Turkey, by Mr. Belen, the resources forests are all public, and also large area of public forests are here in Sardinia, uh, in Tunisia, so favouring access by local populations and small and medium enterprises to these huge resources that are very often untapped is very important. So we must devise tenders and auctions in the way that these uh, la local uh, holders are encouraged and able to participate. And this by creating uh, cooperatives, by designing the tenders in a way that they are um, uh, you know, brought in. And then promoting entrepreneurship targeted to the downstream integration of value chains and especially developing place-based local value chains has been um, described by Mr. Petenella as one strategy to uh, fight against this global and uh, extremely competitive uh, market. So developing local uh, networks and uh, capacity among local actors, as in the case of the distilleries of essential oils in many parts of Southern Europe that uh, help increase the margins for all the actors from the producers to the uh, processors and uh, consumers. Uh, at the same time, it is important to combine different sources of revenues for forest holders. The synergies with ecotourism and experiential tourism has been described outstandingly by Mr. Katsupas in Greece, but several examples have been also shown by Mr. Petenella for Fungo di Borgotaro, for Fiera Internazionale d'Alba, through Forum by the European Forest Institute. They are all events where uh, uh, the bond uh, between the consumer and uh, so the experiential uh, service is provided and it's important the connection with the territory and that is why promoting voluntary certification and labeling standards that refer to quality and the origin like uh, uh, PDO or IGP there are several it is, ex is extremely valuable for these uh, value chains. <clears throat> 
and promoting uh, genuine products that have to be uh, diversified, distinguished from global markets has been mentioned again by Mr. Petanella. So voluntary certification and labeling standards like the Fair Wild certification, specifically if they target process rather than performance, uh, are very important to make these products reach the right, uh, the re the right markets. And of course, payment for ecosystem services, they have been mentioned. Um, they are a way of, of paying back uh, the producer for all the services um, they provide in forest management. Uh, the implementation of these systems is, however, lagging behind. There are several studies, there are laws, uh, but uh, we must foster the uptake and the real world implementation of these instruments to bridge the, the market failure of some of these uh, policies we put in place. Uh, and then the issue of, of innovative fiscal and labour regimes have been described uh, excellently by Mr uh, Vidale for the mushroom sector in Italy and by Mr Fernandez for the uh, policy on labours for raising tappers in, in Spain. The, the prerequisite of these, the precondition, let's say, is that the, the rules must be very cl clear. Uncertainty leads to grey markets, so we must make very clear in regulatory terms uh, what are the bureaucratic burdens, though smart, but bureaucratic burdens and the tax thresholds that the producer has to uh, comply with uh, is if he is a farmer or a um, collector, if he's a professional or non-professional, uh, rules must be pretty clear if we, if we want uh, uh, traceable, a traceable economy and to uh, favour um, mandatory registration. Of course, these have to be adopted at the national level, uh, like in the case of the law 145 adopted in Italy, which uh, Enrico referred to, but um, there must be also a harmonization, a coherence across European countries to avoid cross-boundary um, distortive effects, like in the case of, of VAT or CAP measures. And finally, the equitability and the role of producers' organization. Uh, they are very important to um, stimulate, strengthen, and um, build the capacities of producers uh, to uh, have a, a greater negotiation power uh, with respect to intermediaries in the market, in the glass hour shape that uh, Davide Petanella showed. Um, and uh, they are important steps to increase also the transparency. There are tools like platforms, this is CMEF in Portugal, price observatories that are proving very effective, for example, in the cork sector in Portugal. And these are uh, flagship initiatives that are being promoted to, for cross-boundary contamination in Italy, uh, Tunisia and, and France. Then with uh, Julia Muir's presentation, we just gave a glance at the very, very important issue of, of transparency. Julia has described, has brought in all the knowledge and experience of uh, and role of FAO in the visibility uh, of non-wood forest products. Uh, traceability has been mentioned also as a key uh, important step and access to data. These are the three main domains in our view for transparency and the visibility has been addressed by Julia with reference to the species, the surveys that need to be done in a systematic ways. In terms of traceability, we can rely on mandatory traceability for food goods, for non-wood forest products, which, however, are not yet fully enforced. Or we can devise smart due diligence systems, uh, possibly based on the, the knowledge that we gain through the EUTR on timber. And we must encourage voluntary certifications that usually have uh, a precondition as a precondition traceability and we talked about the importance of the guarantee of origin in in that uh, also julia mentioned the labeling smart labeling qr code and apps for uh, closing and making a closer connection between the final consumer and the producer um, and these are also uh, innovations that we should be looking into 
Uh, and finally, uh, we must facilitate access to data production, commercialization and trade. If we want entrepreneurs to enter the non-wood forest product value chains, we must give them some information, reliable information on what are the conditions of these markets. And in this um, success cases, um, uh, disseminated through platforms like the OPLA database uh, of the European, communi uh, communi commu European Commission uh, by um, uh, the nature-based solutions uh, database, but also the incredible uh, knowledge repository on success cases for non-wood forest products are a very useful tool for this cross-contamination um, among countries and among sectors. And with this very short overview, I'll um, close my presentation. I thank you for your attention and I wish you have a very uh, interesting uh, forum. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for uh, introducing us to uh, the actions or explaining the actions. I would like perhaps to mention that these actions, so the ones that uh, Sarah have, uh, has mentioned, uh, are quite clearly described and explained in the white paper. There's a whole section on basically this uh, value chains and on uh, transparency. Uh, I see that in the meantime, we have a question and I think Sarah Adams is working to give that person the right to uh, perhaps uh, ask a question in person. Are we ready for that, Sarah? Sarah? Yes, um, Sylvia Stefanelli, I just gave you rights um, to ask your question live. Um, even though your question has been answered in the question and answer by several of the panelists, I think it's interesting um, to bring this one um, to the attention of the forum and have maybe some responses from the panelists live as well. So, let me see. there you are, Sylvia. Great. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for replying very quickly. Yes, my question was about. Um, we are aware now that there is an increasing pressure on the European forests coming from the climate targets, from the renewable energy targets, uh, by economy. Uh, so I wonder whether uh, in the long run, uh, up to 2000. Uh, 30 and 50, which are the two <laughs> climate targets set up by the European Union, there, there will be a conflict in uh, the use of uh, forest resources, given the pressure um, on, 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 on these increasing targets, particularly on bioenergy and the, the bioeconomy, but also carbon sequestration, because we are asking more and more to forest in terms of, um, you know, being uh, strengthening the carbon sink. So what's your position on this? Will European forests be able to deliver all these services, including um, uh, um, non-wood forest products, or at a certain moment, uh, policymakers, uh, users will have to decide which, is, uh, which are the best services for that uh, ecosystem? Thank you. I think, Alvaro, as you have been, uh, as you have initiated to answer that question already in the chat, perhaps this is a question you can take right now. Is that okay for you? You're muted, uh, Alvaro. It seems we have a problem. Yeah. Okay. He's not muted, but we don't hear his audio. Inacio's okay. got his hand. Let's, let's, switch, no, let's switch to Inacio, who has raised his hands. Uh, so Inacio, can, uh, would you like to, have, to, to react to this? Yes, I will very briefly. I think this is a very, it's a very relevant question. It came also yesterday, uh, the question of already, can we put so much burden in, in, into the forest? Can we supply everything? And I think uh, if we look at the bioeconomy in general, it's clear that we, we cannot replace all we do with biomaterials. Uh, but the, the, and especially there are many bull commodities that we cannot replace. Uh, we cannot do energy with the forest, but we can replace many other things uh, and, and other value products and really contribute to the economy. So of course the, the balance is difficult. My only reflection was here that if we consider the enormous expansion of Mediterranean forests, 
uh, since the turn of the century or even since the end of World War II when we started the fossil-based economy in a different dimension. Forests have expanded maybe from an average of less than 10% of forest cover in the Mediterranean to maybe an average which is approaching 50% now and in some cases is, is above. So we really have expanding forest resource and we have not found the, the balance to manage this forest now. And, and sometimes it's, it's wildfires that is putting the, the equilibrium back and, and generating also great emissions. So we really need to, to find innovative ways and, and find a good equilibrium between managing our forests, preserving them, and, and, and reaching a system where these, these services like, like wildfires or, or consumption of water, excessive consumption of water in, in, in certain catchments uh, can, be, can be managed. And, and for this, uh, all these value chains based in non forest products can really play a, a, magnific a magnificent role. Uh, so we really need to balance biodiversity, water, wildfires uh, through, uh, re through good um, um, value chains that allow us to invest in the forest. So I was saying yesterday that Mediterranean forests are a sink of resources and we're not e we even able to manage them. So we really need to overcome this. And of course, of course, this, this needs to be done with use and not abuse, as our early morning speaker uh, told us before. So of course, we need, we need some barriers. We need to be looking at it. We need uh, core sustainability principles here. And we should avoid um, commodities with high demand in terms of, of, of biomass and low or land use and, and low climatic and economic impacts. We, we should go to the top of the pyramid where we produce climatic services and, and, and jobs. Let's put it this way. Excellent. Thank you so much for this intervention, uh, Inacio. I would like to, to say to Alvaro, if you feel that uh, the settings have been restored, just signal it and then we will be more than happy to give you the word. In the meantime, uh, let's go to Sven Walter, who also signaled that he uh, wanted to make a statement. Sven, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Just to echo what uh, Inacio said, I mean, um, we are talking a lot about the bioeconomy. We are noting that there's an increased demand in forest product. We have some information, for example, on wood, on pellets, which are increasing. So there's an increasing demand and we need to know what is the projections of future demands and also of supply. So I think there we need to have you know, more information, more scenarios in order to see what policies should be in place. And of course, how to promote a cascading use of forest products and non-wood forest products should definitely be part of it. And I would just also to echo what, uh, what my colleague um, Julia mentioned and which we discussed also with different colleagues before that with regard to the wood products where FAO is managing, for example, the, the, the yearbook on forest products and on wood statistics, we have a working group which brings together, for example, the European Commission Eurostat the International Tropical Timber Organization and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe as a statutory body in order to advise and provide coordinated data. And that is something we could indeed think about, you know, how to join forces when it comes to non-wood forest products. And so if partners, if institutions are interested to collaborate on this, it would be good to join forces. Please, you know, contact us and probably also, you know, colleagues from EFI we discussed it through, for example, Silver Mediterranean, which is a useful platform, but we could even think it at a global level and see what is the data available, what could be the flagship products, as we called them before, to, to get better data. Because again, only together, and if we provide the evidence together, we can convince the statisticians to include it. And we are happy to, to support this and uh, work with uh, participants and institutions on this topic. Thanks. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Sven, for this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as a next step, I would mm. like to proceed with the following. So you have been introduced basically to several of the actions that are part of the topic of today, so the, the value chains. Sara Maltoni also mentioned a couple of additional actions. What we would like to do now is a short survey, and I will initiate my screen and then at the same time explain what the purpose is. Yes, so basically we have these actions and we have two main reasons why we would like to have your opinion on these actions. So the white paper proposes actions to build competitive and equitable non-wood forest products value chains and to enhance transparency, data and information flows on non-wood forest products. So we have presented to you six actions uh, today. I will show them immediately. The question we have for you is the following. How do you rate 
the estimated impact of these actions relative to each other. So if you feel that one of these actions, and I will show them here. So if you feel that some of these actions are not important, then you have to single it. So you can single, no, I think this is not going to have any impact. It's important for us to know because maybe we made a mistake in formulating and selecting these actions. But at the same time, you can rate each of these six actions. So the first three had to do about the value chains and the final three, invisibility, traceability, access to data, are the three final ones that uh, Sarah has uh, mentioned. Huh? So these are the six. And we would like to have your scores on these six actions. If you think the action is not important, you can give a low score. If you think it is highly important, you can give a high score. How to do this? Well, please go to Google Club. And I hope that somebody is putting even the reference or the uh, the link, the web link in the chat. Uh, I can't do it right now. Yes, I'm having, yes I, I see the link is already in the Google Club, but it says Wool Club. There is a mistake. It says, so it should be oh, Wool Club, okay. not Wool Club, please. So if you just go to wooclub.com and then dial in SDQXLN as a code, you should be in the uh, survey and we are welcoming your reactions your input right now please go ahead i see the number of participants participating rising quickly so it seems many of you have found book club and the right survey so we are 40 43 participants and it's still counting which is very good please give us your feedback it's important for us to know if you agree with these actions or not it's your way basically it's uh, to 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 simulate So it might be that on your screen, you need to scroll to see all six actions. And when you have selected, don't forget please to submit the results. You have to put the submit button. I see the first results coming in, which is great. I give you two more minutes to finalize, to cast your votes. So the question is about the impact. How impactful do you think this action is going to be? And that obviously pre-assumes, presupposes that we will be able to implement the action. So it's about the impact. How impactful do you think this action is going to be? We have almost 50 persons that have completed the survey, which is great. And we still keep on counting. We have 72 participants participating to the survey. And I will give a little bit more time to see if the number of people that have finished the survey. And please don't forget to push the uh, submit button. Otherwise, your vote is not counted. So 54 persons have submitted their votes. This is the final minute. If you want to cast your vote, this is the time to do it. Thirty seconds left. So we have 57 respondents that have completed the survey. So I think there are still a couple of persons that either have forgotten to push the submit button or that are still completing the survey. 59 have completed, which is great. Okay, good. You can keep on uh, those that are still doing this uh, uh, survey. 
can continue to do so. But perhaps I can already ask for a reaction from uh, Sarah Maltoni's side. So we see that uh, several actions are around 5.5 uh, level, I would say. One action is slightly higher. It's on improved visibility of Norwood Forest products. And one is slightly lower, but still a high score. So that is equitability in the role of producers organizations. But that's what the score says. How, how do you feel about this, Sarah? Well, it seems that the last three actions, which form the transparency issues, are perceived like more important. They all have a higher score than the rest, the first three uh, actions, group of actions, let's say, uh, which means that all the participants feel that the lack of data, the lack of information flow and uh, transparency and the connection probably between the consumers and the uh, producers through appropriate labeling and the clarity through appropriate coding. Uh, they want to know more. They feel this lack of data. And uh, I think this is very important because once there is a consumer push, people are informed of what are the values of the non-wood forest products, what, how good they are for the environment. Um, they can promote responsible purchases and this probably will trigger then uh, in a second round the value chains and there in the value chains of course we will need to be ready with um, I see now 5.5 equal <laughs> between the fiscal and labor regimes and local value chains uh, so the governments need to be ready with uh, a mix of policies between fiscal and labor regimes that are ready to support these upcoming opportunities in the market and um, the issue of local value chains and territorial marketing has been very well described by Mr. Petanella uh, in his opening keynote. And uh, I think that is also very much scored. Maybe the role of producers organization lies a bit behind as um, you know, a backup that must be there to strengthen the producers, but maybe it's not yet perceived as something that is, you know, in the upfront of, of policies. Although maybe I didn't mention interbranch organizations that favor cross-sectoral uh, um, agreements and arrangements. Um, Mr. Petenella mentioned co uh, network contracts. Um, so uh, they can be also very valuable. Yeah. So. It is a surprise that the last section is felt as more important than, than this, uh, the first three, but it has uh, a meaning, uh, a good meaning. Well, for sure, for sure it, it is, this is in the nuance of the data, obviously, and this is by no way a scientific survey, and so let's, let's take it for what it is. Uh, but we should state that even, well, the lowest scoring action, which is on equitability and role of producers organization, has still a high score. So for us, it is a confirmation that all of the actions that have been proposed basically get support from the people that uh, uh, have responded to the survey. And I think this is very important news. We got a comment from um, Judy Trice that states, I'm a producer, that's why I see it different than the most voters. And this is indeed uh, probably going to be the case that everybody is uh, uh, going to, to score these actions based on uh, the personal position, which is the ID, by the way. Huh? Excellent. Um, good, I think that looking at the time, I'm quickly checking if there's anything else that needs to be said in the Q&A right now. If it is not the case, I think we can say, I'm quickly looking at the panelists, if there's anything else, no. In that case, well, let me conclude then this uh, third session. I think we had a very interesting uh, combination of video material presentations, the Pecha Kucha challenges, uh, the survey, and I think we all got a better understanding of what's on, at stake with respect to the, uh, the value chain, the so non-wood forest products value chain. As a final, before sending you off, as a final question, I would like to remind you that we still have this manifesto that is going to be discussed uh, in the next session, and we are still welcoming your comments, 
your contributions or your suggestions uh, until two o'clock this afternoon, because we will need a little bit of time uh, to produce, to, to uh, go through all the comments. We already had some contributions and we're very much grateful for that. I see that Sven probably wants to make a statement on that. So please, Sven, I hand over to you, please. Yeah, no, just because you just mentioned it. Thanks a lot for the inputs we got already. We are going through it. We may also reply to you on this and then we will get uh, back to you in session four. So again, thanks a lot for the inputs provided. Excellent. Well, that being said, I would like to thank all speakers for the excellent uh, efforts and input. I think we all enjoyed this. Thank you so much also for the for being with us, dear attendees. Without you, this would not make much sense, obviously. Huh? Uh, we thank you for your energy, for your questions, and we hope to see you back three o'clock this afternoon. Goodbye.